going to make sure we are good on our social media platforms. And it looks like. We are live. All right, so let's begin. <laughs> Friends, welcome to the Centennial Institute webinar on reviewing the Supreme Court's decision on LGBTQ workplace civil rights. My name is Jeff Hunt. I have the wonderful privilege of serving as the Vice President of Public Policy for Colorado Christian University, where I help direct our think tank, the Centennial Institute. Today, we are proud to welcome Michael Norton, a Centennial Institute Fellow, to review this week's Supreme Court decision on LGBTQ workplace civil mm -hmm. rights. What was decided? How did Justice Gorsuch come to his conclusion? Does his decision meet the standards of textualism? What was Justice Alito and Justice Kavanaugh's dissent? What does this mean for Christian businesses, churches, and religious organizations? Now, uh, Mike Norton has a very distinguished career and a very long bio, which uh, you can read on our website, but I'll go through just a few things here. He serves with Thomas Scheffel and Associates here in Denver, Colorado, preserving the religious freedoms of Coloradans and other Americans guaranteed by the First Amendment. He has been in practice, private practice for nearly 40 years, served with Alliance Defending Freedom for many years, uh, working to protect the sanctity of life and uncovering and prosecuting healthcare frauds by abortion providers. He was appointed by President Ronald Reagan as U.S. Attorney for Colorado, uh, has served in a number of other capacities with the U.S. Justice Department, but probably most importantly, as I would say myself, uh, our spouses really do uh, highlight uh, our great family work, and, and that's the same with uh, Mike Norton, his wife, Jane Norton, uh, served as Colorado's 46th Lieutenant Governor from 2003 to 2007. They have four children, seven grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. Mike, uh, I know that bio may be a little outdated. Any more grandchildren or great-grandchildren to add to the mix here? We, we actually have two more grandchildren, or great-grandchildren, I should say, uh, since, since I last looked at that, and I apologize for not updating <laughs> you on that, but they keep coming. <laughs> Well, that's that great. <laughs> that's wonderful. Well, uh, Mike, we have a lot to discuss. Uh, I think all of us were a little shocked by this r decision that came out just this past week. I believe it was on Tuesday uh, or possibly Monday, Tuesday about uh, LGBTQ civil rights in the workplace. Give us an overview of what this decision was, why it's important, what was ultimately decided, and then we can get into specifics about kind of what we think about it. But can you give us an overview of just the case that went before the Supreme Court? Uh, I can, Jeff. Thank you very much. And by the way, I, I'm in full agreement with you that we have totally married above our our standing with uh, Nicole and your and your uh, side and Jane on my side. So thank you for that. Yeah, this <clears throat> this no doubt was to many of us, particularly many of us who are uh, conservative Christians and uh, and uh, have uh, really <clears throat> strongly championed uh, President Trump's uh, judicial nominees uh, to not only the uh, Supreme Court, but also to, <clears throat> excuse me, courts of appeal and lower courts as well as being uh, conservatives and strict constructionists and people who would follow the law as written and not make up new laws uh, as they went along. And what is the, and what we're shocked about is that the majority opinion was written by uh, Justice Neil Gorsuch, uh, from Colorado, who has been on the bench uh, a little over a year now, maybe two years, almost going on two years. Uh, he was the author of the majority decision. Uh, six to three was the outcome of the vote. Chief Justice Roberts uh, joined uh, in that majority decision, along with the four so-called liberals or progressives on the court, uh, Ginsburg, Breyer, Sotomayor, and Kagan. Justice Alito filed a uh, dissent uh, that was joined in by Justice Clarence Thomas and Justice Kavanaugh filed a separate dissent of his own. Uh, this all re revolved around uh, the me meaning of the word sex in Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. That law makes it unlawful for an employer to fail or refuse to hire or to discharge any individual or to otherwise discriminate against any individual because of such individuals' race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. And for approximately 50 years, courts 
around the country had interpreted the word sex in that uh, statute to mean binary sex, male or female, biological sex, uh, not anything beyond that. And the court had held over past uh, uh, cases and decisions that the words because of in the, the context of Title VII meant that if sex is any part of the reason for a person's uh, uh, disciplinary action or dismissal or firing, it triggers Title VII. It doesn't make any difference if there are other factors that are involved. If sex is one of those factors, it triggers Title VII. After Gorsuch's opinion, uh, one observer who could very well have been me or perhaps even you based on our discussion said this. He said, if you'd have told people 56 years ago that they were voting for a bill to equate the situation of transgender people of whom no one had heard of since that word had not yet found its way into the English language with the situation of African-American people, they'd have thought you were crazy. And quite frankly, I think the Supreme Court is crazy in this ruling. The way this case came up to the Supreme Court was through three different circuits uh, opinions that were split in their outcome. Up until that time, 30 courts of appeals had ruled that Title VII, the word sex, did not include sexual orientation or gender uh, identity. But in the last year or so, uh, three circuit courts, the first, the second court, uh, circuit, uh, which covers the states of New York, Connecticut, and Vermont, concluded that Title VII barred discrimination based on sexual orientation. In that case, a gentleman by the name of Dan Donald Zarda, who worked as a skydiving instructor for a company in New York, had um, mentioned after several years on the job that he was gay, and shortly thereafter, he was fired. The U U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit, which covers Alabama, Florida, and Georgia, came to the opposite conclusion. In that case, which is really the title case of the opinion, Bostock is the gentleman's name. He had run an award-winning child welfare services program for Clayton County, Georgia, and was fired after uh, he began participating in a gay recreational softball league uh, contest for, quote, conduct unbecoming of a county employee. The 11th Circuit held that Title VII did not prohibit employees for firing employees for being gay and dismissed uh, Bostock's Title VII complaint. In the third case, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission had filed a lawsuit in federal court in Michigan <coughs> against a funeral home uh, where a person had worked for six years, been hired as a male uh, funeral director to uh, console people, bereave people who were distressed about the death of a loved one. And in, six years into that employment, uh, announced that uh, she would begin living and working as a woman. Uh, Chief, uh, the, 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 the opinion by Justice Gorsuch starts out with the words, today we must decide whether an employer can fire someone simply for being homosexual and transgender. He concludes the answer is clear. When an employer fires an employee for being homosexual and tra or transgender, that employee fires the person for traits or actions it would not have questioned in members of a different sex. Therefore, he said, sex plays a necessary and undisguisable role in the decision, exactly what Title VII uh, forbids. He explained that the Supreme Court, and this is uh, sort of where he gets off on his originalist textualist uh, position, the Supreme Court generally interprets a law by looking at how the public would have understood the law when it was passed. The law's ordinary meaning at the time of enactment usually governs. But just because a new application emerges, emerges, he said, that is both unexpected and important, the court still has an obligation to enforce the plain terms of the law and not simply to punt the matter back to Congress because it's something new and unexpected uh, from those who passed the law uh, at the outset. Many, he said, maybe even most of Title VII's uh, obligations regarding the sex uh, component of uh, discrimination were unanticipated at the time of the law's adoption. And when the express terms of the statute give us one answer and extra textual considerations suggest another, it's no contest, the law controls, only the written word and the law controls. So Gorsuch is essentially reasoning that from a straight textualist, originalist uh, uh, perspective, the word sex in Title VII includes sexual orientation and gender identity, something that would have been a surprise to every member of the United States Congress who voted either for or against Title VII in 1964, and probably to every living human being on the planet, or at least in the United States of America in 1964 as well. And all that matters, uh, Gorsuch stressed, is whether changing the employee's sex would have yielded a different choice uh, by the employer. He cited as an example a case of an employer where two employees who are both attracted to men are, 
for all intents and purposes, identical in terms of their capabilities, but one is male and one is female. If the employer fires the male employee only because he is attracted to men while keeping the female employee, the employer has violated Title VII because the employer has looked to sex as a reason for the termination. Title VII's um, prohibition of sex discrimination, he finally concluded, is a major piece of federal civil rights legislation. It is written in starkly broad terms. It has repeatedly produced unexpected applications, at least in the view of those on the receiving end of them. And he continued, sometimes at the beginning of his opinion, small gestures have unexpected consequences. Major initiatives practically guarantee that. Gorsuch did address uh, in the latter part of the opinion, broader concerns that employers had raised in the three cases about the effect of the court's ruling on issues like bathrooms in the workplace, locker rooms and dress codes, uh, sports, college education issues and such as that. And he concluded uh, that those, none of those issues were before the court. Whether sex segregated bathrooms or locker rooms or dress codes might violate Title VII's are questions for future cases. And I can guarantee you there will be plenty of future cases as a result of this decision. The same he said is true of uh, relationships between Title VII and federal laws uh, and constitutional provisions protecting religious liberty, religious freedom. He said, and I quote, we are also deeply concerned with preserving the promise of the free exercise of religion enshrined in our constitution. That guarantee, that guarantee lies at the heart of our pluralistic society. But once again, I can assure you that there will be a plethora of lawsuits uh, challenging uh, the religious exemptions that exist in such statutes as Religious Freedom Restoration Act, even Title VII itself uh, uh, has such an exemption. Let me, uh, let me turn to uh, Kavanaugh's dissent because I think Kavanaugh's dissent is, is um, a very much stark contrast, if you will, with, uh, with Gorsuch's uh, majority opinion. Uh, Kavanaugh acknowledged that the policy arguments for amending Title VII were very weighty. He observed that the Supreme Court had previously stated, uh, and he fully agreed that gay and lesbian Americans cannot be treated as social outcasts or as inferior in dignity and worth. And he took aim at Gorsuch's claim to be a textualist and quoted several different times Justice Scalia, after whom uh, Justice Gorsuch uh, tends to model himself uh, for the proposition that, uh, as Scalia said, the good textualist is not a literalist. And yet here, what Gorsuch had done was applied the literal meaning of the word sex as it had evolved or as it had progressively uh, essentially been uh, developed over the last uh, 40 or 50 years. Uh, time and time again, said Kavanaugh, this court has rejected literalism in favor of ordinary meaning. And mark, mark this uh, uh, important clearly, take note of this, because Kavanaugh is saying the ordinary meaning of the word sex means male or female. It does not mean sexual orientation or gender identity. And when we uh, do something other than here, adhere to the ordinary meaning of phrases, not just the literal meaning of words, both the rule of law and democratic accountability badly suffer when the court adopts hidden or obscure uh, meanings according uh, uh, that are not in accord with its ordinary meaning. So according to the majority's quote, literalist approach, Kavanaugh added, Title VII's prohibition against sex discrimination prohibits also prohibits sexual orientation discrimination and actually has done so, he says, and since 1964, unbeknownst to everyone, everyone in the United States of America. And this literalist approach deprives ordinary meaning and the citizens, citizens of this country a fair notice of what the law is. So Kavanaugh concluded, we're not judges. We are judges, we're not members of Congress. Under the Constitution, separated, separation of powers, the responsibility to uh, amend Title VII belongs to the Congress and the President uh, in the legislative process, not to this court. Our rule is not to make or amend the law. As written, Title VII does not prohibit employment discrimination because of sexual orientation. Then turning to Alito's dissent, which was joined by Thomas, it, it essentially excoriated, excoriated uh, Justice Gorsuch. He uses incredible words uh, to describe the, uh, the majority opinion. He says the question before the court is not whether discrimination because of sexual orientation or gender identity should be outlawed. It's whether Congress did that in 1964 
and indisputably it did not. He conceded that the majority opinion no doubt arises from humane and generous impulses, but that's the job of Congress, not the job of the court. Neither sexual orientation nor gender identity appears on the list of the five specified employment discrimination grounds. And as long as an employer does not discriminate on the basis of one of those five grounds, the employer is free to decide for himself or herself or itself which characteristics are relevant to its employment decisions. There is only one word, said Alito, for what this court has done today, and that is legislation. He noted that for the past 45 years, bills had in, been introduced in Congress to add sexual orientation and even recently gender identity, but they have all failed. They have failed to pass both houses. And he said, in 1964, ordinary Americans reading the text of Title VII would not have dreamed that discrimination because of sex meant discrimination because of sexual orientation, much less gender identity. Today, uh, Alito contended his colleagues in the majority have essentially taken the uh, Democrats, House Democrats' uh, uh, equity bill and passed it uh, in the guise of statutory interpretation. He says a more brazen abuse of our authority is hard to recall. The arrogance of the majority's argument is breathtaking. No one, he added, should be fooled by the attempt to pass off this decision as the inevitable product of the textualist school of statutory interpretation, interpretation championed by uh, our late colleague, Justice Scalia. What it actually represents is a theory of statutory interpretation that Scalia excoriated, the theory that one that the court should update old statutes so that they better reflect the current values of society. So in sum, the dissents were very, very strong uh, against uh, the majority opinion. And the question sort of presents itself, how did the Supreme Court get to the six to three vote? And of course, I don't know that we'll ever know uh, the answer to that, but there's some, I think, valid speculation on why Chief Justice Roberts joined the majority uh, to make six to three. Uh, when I think he learned, uh, this, is, this is sheer speculation, but I think it's a, a vi valid speculation. When I think Chief Justice Roberts learned uh, of, of uh, Gorsuch's position on, on this uh, matter, that uh, sexual orientation and gender identity uh, were, were morphed into or wrapped into the, the word sex in the Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, he had no choice uh, but to join the minority so as to make sure that a five-member majority uh, led by the most senior justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, would not assign the opinion to somebody like Ruth Bader Ginsburg. It would have been far worse of an opinion had Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, written it than had uh, uh, Gorsuch written it. So I think that there's some potential strategy on, on uh, Robert's part in joining majority that we may or may not ever know about, but that's simply a guess uh, from my part. Um, and I think for many other parts as well. The question uh, that you asked about whether or not this fits in with originalism or textualism, I think I've touched on that in both the uh, uh, majority opinion where Gorsuch takes the opinion that this, the plain and ordinary meaning of the word sex includes sexual orientation uh, and uh, gender identity, whereas uh, both uh, Alito in his dissent and Kavanaugh in his dissent uh, take great, great issue with that. The ordinary meaning of the word sex in 1964 at the time that the statute was enacted meant male and female, nothing more, nothing less. It did not include sexual orientation and general gender identity. Those were two totally separate and distinct concepts uh, that Congress has dealt with as two totally separate and distinct contact, uh, concepts for the last uh, 50 years. Words matter. The judge's job is to follow words that are in the law. There is no other criterion to constrain judicial interpretation, so said Justice Antonin Scalia. So also was, at least until the Bostock decision, Justice Gorsuch supposed to be an originalist and textualist. He prided himself uh, on that uh, philosophy. I can recall at his uh, confirmation hearing, he said judges would make pretty rotten legislators. It would be a pretty poor way to run a democracy. In this originalist textualist capacity, many compared Gorsuch favorably to uh, Justice Scalia. And as it turns out, Justice Kavanaugh is, in my view, much more of an originalist textualist than is Justice Gorsuch. Question is, what's next? What's on the horizon next? What happens uh, after Bostock? Um, as I said, the immediate result of uh, Bostock is to have effectively passed the Democratic Party's Equality Act into law. This is a bill that would have amended the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and several other 
laws regarding employment, housing, public education, federal funding, credit, and the jury system to in explicitly include sexual orientation and gender identity as protected characteristics. I might add that in his 107 page dissent, Justice Alito, as one of his appendices, identified over 100 federal laws where the word sex appears in those federal laws. Each one of those federal laws is very likely going to be affected by uh, this decision. But, but by enacting the Equality Act, the Democrats Equality Act, by a judicial dis uh, decision, you can see where Justice Alito comes down with the uh, view that this is nothing short of legislation. About half the states uh, in the United States and the, the states in the United States and most large cities already practice what this decision is now mandated. Colorado does so through the Colorado uh, Civil Rights Commission, as, as you well know. But the implications for the future are, are just unknown. Most observers, whether conservative or liberal, expect them to be sweeping, the consequences to be sweeping. And unless Congress acts to clarify the word sex in the Civil Rights Act, of 1964 does not include sexual orientation and gender identity, Bostock will reshape federal laws for years to come in ways that, in my opinion, will increasingly marginalize uh, social conservatives, people of faith, and people in the public square who want to espouse those ideas. Uh, Title VII has an exemption in it uh, that exempts out uh, uh, religious organizations, uh, but even that is at stake with this decision now. Uh, Religious Freedom Restoration Act um, uh, theoretically provides that laws uh, that unduly burden uh, uh, religious uh, exercise of religion uh, must, um, uh, must be both generally applicable, must further a compelling government interest, and must be the least restrictive means of furthering that compelling government interest. We, we argued these, uh, the, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in all of the uh, Restoration Act in all of the contraceptive uh, Obamacare uh, abortion mandate uh, cases uh, a few years ago and, and did so very successfully. But even RIFRA is under attack. And uh, uh, the uh, so-called ministerial exception where uh, uh, churches uh, uh, may hire employees as ministers uh, who, who practice and abide by the faith tenets of the organization, of the religious organization, that too, I think, is, is going to be challenged. There's no reason uh, to believe that the expansion uh, of uh, Title VII uh, will not expand to public accommodations such as locker rooms, educational institutions, girls' sports, housing, room rentals, almost every other uh, aspect of public life imaginable uh, in, in, uh, in, our, in our society. And each of the dissenting justices expressed the same concern for, for, perform, uh, for preserving religious freedom. Alito pointed out in his dissent that acting on religious beliefs could expose a church to serious, if not existential risks because of this newly expanded reach of Title VII. And the same risk applies to religious schools or religious nonprofits. Congress could enact a meaningful and robust religious liberty protection for churches, religious schools, and other religious organizations but I don't think in, under the current uh, arrangement of the House of Representatives and the Senate, that is very likely uh, to happen. Congress could clarify uh, that the word sex and civil rights does not refer to sexual orientation or general identity or gender identity, but I don't think that's likely to happen either. And Congress could take action to state that certain actions and do not, uh, certain actions and decisions do not constitute discrimination and thereby protect the ability, protect the ability of institutions to offer single sex facilities and programs on the basis of biology rather than identity. But under the present circumstances, I don't think that is likely to happen. So what should people of faith do? Well, the Centennial Institute is a, is a great solution to what many people of faith can and should be doing. Support of the Centennial Institute, the Western Conservative Summit, all the programs and initiatives, uh, Jeff, that you uh, tirelessly promote and and work on uh, day after day after day, month after month after month. Your uh, support of you and uh, the Centennial Institute is, is, I think, very huge. Never give in. We should never give in. We should fight for every square inch of freedom. We should stand up for our principles. We should stand up for truth. We should stand up for righteousness. We should stand up for the moral values of the Bible. And we should just keep on keeping on. God has asked us, I think, commanded us, to stand and to stand firm. He hasn't told us we're gonna win, 
And in fact, the outcome uh, uh, on this earth from a secular perspective is not, uh, is not a very pleasant outcome for many people. But nevertheless, we are to stand, to stand firm, and just do the very best job that we can to promote truth, righteousness, and the moral values that we hold so dearly and, so, and cherish so, so closely. So that's sort of it from an overview and a presentation. Let's get on into any questions you or anyone else might have. Hey, Mike, that was just fantastic. I got to tell you, it reminds me of uh, the 2015 Western Conservative Summit. Obergefeld was decided the morning of the 2015 Western <clears throat> Conservative Summit. And, uh, you know, we were going into the summit and there's a, a sense of, of challenge and uh and frustration with that court's decision and lo and behold here comes bill armstrong to the uh <laughs> stage and says fellow patriots now's the time to mount your horses and ride to the sound of gunfire uh charging us that even in the midst of these challenges we've got to continue on because we know the truth and righteousness is on our side uh and that's what we stand for uh mike let's go back you and i both got a chance to hear, hear Neil Gorsuch right before he became the nominee. Uh, I've got his book here, uh, a signed copy. I got a chance to meet him not that long ago when this book came out. Uh, it's just confounding. So I want to take kind of Gorsuch's side here and try to argue from his perspective to see if we can understand, because it, it is baffling when you listen to Gorsuch, when you read his book, why he would come down on this side, because uh, he talks about the importance of the legislative process uh, all throughout his book, that it's, it's full of compromise. And so when you have competing interests like LGBT, uh, civil rights with religious freedom, uh, the legislative process requires those to come together in order to try to find some form of compromise. And you've seen some organizations promote it. We haven't signed on or promoted it, but you saw Fairness for All came out as an attempt to try to find a middle ground on the Equality Act. Uh, so you, you have him making that case, the, the importance of the three branches, the importance of the separation of powers, and then along comes this case. And what I've heard some people argue, and I was on the Federalist Society call the day of this uh, decision, was that uh, his argument is that it does come down to sex because if, uh, if a woman was dating a man, you wouldn't fire that woman. But if the man is dating a man, you would fire him. Therefore, it does come down to sex and is applicable in this. I disagree with it. Like I said, I disagree with that take, but that becomes his position. So then the argument says he is being a textualist. You may not agree with the result, but he is committed to being a textualist because of that argument. Uh, what say you? Well, I think I think there's a couple of different answers that uh, come to mind when I said I've, I've read that book as well. Um, uh, and for the uh, in the in the uh, for the benefit of uh, full disclosure, uh, I uh, did all I could to help uh, Neil Gorsuch get on the United States Supreme Court. I was quite often a, a public spokesperson uh, in the media in Denver. Uh, I read his book. Uh, I talked to him uh, beforehand. Uh, I, uh, I very much thought, I mean, none, none of these nominees will commit on how they might vote on a future case, and of course, such was no different, but I felt uh, quite sure, just as you've articulated, that uh, he, would, uh, he, would not, he would not simply pay lip service to the uh, legislative process and the, uh, the role, the, th the three, three branch roles of government, the separation powers roles of government. I thought very, very, um, very sincerely that he would uh, uh, abide by and apply those uh, that separation of power to his decision. So one, one potential answer to the question is, yes, he is a textualist. Yes, he looked at the word sex. And yes, he concluded that decisions uh, based on sexual orientation and, and gender identity relate to sex and therefore they're included in the word sex. And that's a, and that's a legitimate textualist decision. Of course, my uh, liberal friends would call that progressive textualism. They like the idea that uh, we can amend the words uh, by future definitions. If an elephant turns out to be 50 years from now, uh, the description that's given to an alligator, uh, we would want to go ahead and use that progressive definition of an elephant uh, to apply to an alligator 50 years from now. Uh, so he could say, uh, yes, that's the textual determination that I've come to on the word sex. That suggests Congress better be very much better, much more careful in um, 
writing broad legislative proposals and giving either judges or for that matter administrative agencies the power to interpret and apply those broad legislative mandates to things that Congress did not mean, did not intend, and would not uh, have voted for in the first place. Uh, I don't know if this is true or not. I, I was uh, uh, taken by uh, uh, Justice Gorsuch's uh, uh, report uh, that uh, the then chairman of the House Rules Committee, uh, Judge Howard Smith of Virginia, a very conservative uh, member, of, a Democrat member of the legislature, added sexual added sex to the Civil Rights Act, uh, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, because he thought the addition of sex to the Civil Rights Act would result in the defeat of the bill altogether. I have no idea if that's uh, true or not true, but it doesn't square with the other things that he says, is that we don't pay any attention to uh, what legislators say or what the intent of legislators are when the language of the, of the statute is clear and, and unequivocal and unambiguous. So there is that. Congress needs to pay better attention. You can't be passing 2,800 page bills and saying to the public, we'll know what's in it when we see it. Uh, but right now we don't have any idea what's in it. And you know I'm referring to the Affordable Care Act and Nancy <laughs> Pelosi's uh, remarks uh, three or four years ago. So that's one issue. Congress better be sure. And our legislators have to stand up. Our conservative legislators have to stand up and fight this battle to the, to the, to the last um, tooth and nail to be able to make sure that these things uh, uh, are properly defined. Secondly, I just don't think that the history of the ordinary language of the statute squares with his textualist argument. I know he tries to make that argument, and he makes it quite frankly in an over and over repetitious way, uh, assuming apparently that if you say something often enough, it's going to become true, uh, whether it is true at the outset or not. Uh, it, but it just simply does not square with reality. No one, as, as I pointed out, no one in 1964, 74, 84, 94 would have had any idea that sex, the word sex meant anything other than male or female, and that the words sexual orientation or gender identity were totally separate and distinct concepts. The reason that's so obvious is that Congress tried to amend those statutes over and over and over again over the last 40 or so years and did so without uh, success. So I just think that, our, that that's an argument he tries to make and he, and he repeats it over and over again, but it falls, um, it falls flat. He, he does try to point out that this might be a narrow decision. Uh, we all know Jack Phillips's decision was important, but that was also a narrow decision. We would have liked to see that broader uh, when it comes to the, the Baker here in Colorado. It really just went back and kind of targeted the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. But um, do you believe it's narrow? I don't. No, I don't believe it's narrow. I don't believe it's narrow at all, Jeff. And I, th I think the problem with a decision like this is, is just what uh, Justice Alito and Justice Kavanaugh point out, the unforeseen, unintended, unanticipated, unexpected consequences of a decision so broad and so generally applicable to every, every federal statute and states are going to pick up the same thing that don't already have that, uh, that in place, to every federal statute in place, uh, results in, it will result in such widespread litigation uh, by the LGBT community, which is quite frankly very well funded, very well organized, and very well um, focused on uh, where they want to go, that employers in in our land will have will be will be brought to their knees in battling le uh, litigation uh, time after time after time. Every time anyone uh, there's any kind of employment decision involving any person who has any kind of real or imagined sexual identity uh, issue, that's going to be the, the order of the day from a litigation standpoint. The whole new, whole new realm of litigation that will unfold from this day forward. It's very much like the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973. Uh, people of faith uh, and conservative, social conservatives have never agreed that, the, that, the, that, the, that, the, that abortion is, in a, in a, is a proper way of dealing with an unborn child. An unborn child created in the image of God is a human being in, uh, in, in being, in process. And since 1973, people have fought and fought and fought against Roe v. Wade. And ultimately, I think Roe v. Wade may be overturned. I don't know, but I hope ultimately it will. And I hope I see Justice Gorsuch in the majority on that decision as well. But uh, the litigation that uh, Roe v. Wade has spawned over the years and the efforts in legislation in the, both the U U.S. Congress and in state legislature has been enormously expensive just as a result of that one decision. 
1973 as it has been amended from time to time. I believe that same thing for the next 40 or 50 or 60 years is going to happen with regard to this uh, uh, Bostock decision as well. We felt like it's becoming harder and harder to be a Christian in the public square, owning your own business. Uh, I think you mentioned there are carve outs for religious organizations, but we've had to fight a number of these in the Supreme Court here recently. If you look at Hobby Lobby decision was the right to whether or not you could practice your faith and be forced, mandated to provide abortifacients, not just uh, birth care, birth control, but actually abortifacients to employees if it's against your religious convictions. It seems to me, again, in this decision, uh, being a Christian and owning a business in a way and operating it in a way that honors your faith and honors your religious convictions is going to be really challenged uh, as a result of this court case. No question about that, Jeff. I think uh, that's, that's what I meant when I think uh, this decision will even further marginalize Christians uh, in the public square than, uh, than before. Um, and I, I mean, I love Bill Armstrong. Uh, your your comment about uh, how Bill came out and uh, and said now is now is the time to mount your horses and get and get on with the job. This is that time. Uh, quite frankly, too often people of faith in the business community have simply gone along so as to get along with decisions that have come down upon them. They've worked around them. They've uh, supported. Uh, legislators and, uh, and uh, gubernatorial candidates, uh, and in, in some cases, presidential candidates who have the power to appoint uh, judges to uh, the state uh, judiciary or the federal judiciary uh, who can make a difference uh, for conservative values. Uh, now is the time to mount your horses and get back on that effort and support the Centennial Institute for that. Well, I, I hopefully we can be part of the effort to get our nation back on track. Uh, but let's talk about uh, prescriptions here, because part of the 2016 election was Donald Trump saying, I've got a list of Supreme Court justices who aren't going to legislate from the bench. Now, granted, let's give Kavanaugh a bit of credit here because, or not Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, because this is, this is just one decision out of many he's made, and a lot of them haven't been bad. Uh, and in fact, many of them have been on the side of religious freedom. Maybe you could talk about that. but. Uh, this is going to be a real challenge, I think, for the Republican nominee for president, because the argument was get conservatives into office. We're going to appoint the right judges. We're going to get this court back on track to where we have the separation of powers and we're, uh, we're not legislating from the bench. Lo and behold, one of the decisions comes from uh, Gorsuch. So what what does Donald Trump do in the midst of this situation? I've seen the left try to pounce on this and say, this becomes the reason why evangelicals, quote unquote, you know, elected Donald Trump. So now that didn't play out. I think there's an effort to suppress the evangelical vote. And as a reminder, we are a nonprofit 501c3, so we're not endorsing any candidates. But I want to understand the, how this is going to play into the election and what does this mean? Uh, for evangelicals that were supporting the president in the past election? That's a very, very good question and a, an almost an impossible question to, to answer with any, any degree of certainty. Uh, I think it creates, at least in the short term, a quite, quite a serious blow to, uh, to, to the president uh, for all the reasons you just articulated. Uh, President Trump did something as a candidate uh, that I don't believe any other candidate for president had ever done. He released a list of potential nominees to the United States Supreme Court. Justice Gorsuch was on that list. Uh, we had a year uh, or more to be able to vet the names on that list, to be able to uh, determine whether or not uh, there was anything about any of those individuals that would give us uh, pause about uh, seeing uh, those individuals on the United States Supreme Court. Um, uh, there was no reason to think that Justice Gorsuch would uh, go in the direction that he did. I mean, I, I think he's an honorable and decent and honest uh, human being, and I think he thinks he did the right thing with this decision. I think he thinks that it's uh, an example of textualism and originalism, uh, that the word sex does include sexual orientation and gender identity. I just think he's wrong about that. Uh, but if he continues to apply that um, originalist, textualist concept 
to future um, future litigation that comes before the court, including litigation involving Title VII, it could make a huge difference. We talked a little bit about uh, how the court, the Supreme Court over the years has adopted the uh, so-called but-for test with regard to sex in the Title VII. And, and the idea is that but for the uh, decision having something to do with a person's sex, uh, if, if the, if the uh, decision had anything to do with a person's sex, then that triggers a Title VII. That same position has not been uh, has not been applied to the other four factors in the Civil Rights Act. Uh, religion, religious uh, uh, identity, national origin, and, and so forth. That same uh, test has not been applied to those. So if Gorsuch is able to apply those same tests to religion, for example, in Title VII, that'll make a very significant and important difference on a going forward basis for Title VII. So that's one, one answer uh, to, to the question. The second answer is, uh, think of the alternative. Uh, think of uh, the type of justice uh, who would have been on the Supreme Court uh, had President Trump not been able to nominate uh, Justice uh, Gorsuch and Justice Kavanaugh, and hopefully another justice uh, or two before uh, uh, he leaves office. Uh, the, the majority is very narrow right now. It's four to five or five to four in so many cases that, that, that the conservatives need one or two additional justices, I think, to be able to to, uh, to be able to make uh, significant changes. But I much prefer to see Justice uh, Gorsuch on the bench than uh, some of the nominees that I uh, have seen and, and would expect to see from, uh, let's say, a President Biden if he were to be elected. Uh, on the Federal Society call I was on earlier this week, they asked Fed, Federal Society to apologize for Neil Gorsuch. Uh, should we be apologizing for Neil Gorsuch? Oh gosh, uh, I in a way feel uh, that that need as well, uh, since I was uh, so supportive of uh, Neil at the pre-nomination stage. Uh, this is a shock. This decision is a shock to me, to be sure. Uh, but I'm. I think that I think the jury is still out. Let's see what happens in uh, years going forward uh, with Gorsuch and his opinions. Again, if he sticks with this textualist originalism concept and applies words. I, I'd rather see him apply words as they ordinarily, as the ordinarily meaning suggests rather than come up with some new uh, uh, definition of a word that's never been applied before. But if he continues to do that, I think uh, other significant decisions, including some uh, religious liberty decisions and perhaps abortion decisions in, in the months ahead uh, could, could turn out much better than we, than we would expect. One of the things that was pointed out was that uh, liberal justices almost never moderate. They pretty much stay on the left yeah. the entire time on the court. Conservative yeah. justices from time to time are conservative, but other times moderate. And so what you end up with is the slow march to the left with the U.S. Supreme Court. And I think a lot of conservatives are frustrated by that. Uh, uh, these are decisions that need to be, like in this case with Bostock, these are decisions that need to be made by the legislature. And yet we continue this slow march to the left with the Supreme Court. I think, uh, I think it's frustrating for a lot of us. It's frustrating in, in many respects because, as you've said, the, the, the four liberal justices, Ginsburg, uh, uh, um, Sotomayor, Kagan, and Breyer, they're not going to change. Uh, they're not going to. They're not going to moderate uh, their positions. Uh, if Gorsuch comes up with a uh, different idea on a different case going forward, those four justices are going to be in the same location as they are now. They're going to be opposed to anything that's not progressive, that's not liberal, that doesn't uh, legislate morality from the bench. Um, I don't know that Gorsuch quite grasped that uh, uh, in this decision. Uh, it seems to me that he seems to think that. Uh, uh, reason and uh, good arguments uh, will prevail in the in the future with these four justices. When I don't believe, just as you've articulated, that will be the case. Well, friends, we've got just a few minutes left here. If you're on Facebook or on uh, YouTube, go ahead and ask some questions. Uh, one question was, uh, "What's the process for overturning this?" I, there have been overturned uh, decisions overturned at the U.S. Supreme Court, Mike, but that is a big ask. Yeah. It doesn't happen all that frequently. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's true in many respects. The, the, the good news, if you will, is that this 
decision relates to a statute. It's not a constitutional principle that will come back to uh, uh, haunt uh, this nation with regard to future um, application of future, uh, in, in future cases. It is a statute and the statute is enacted by the legislature and the legislature can change the statute. And I suggested a couple of ways uh, that the legislature can do that by, by clarifying religious liberty rights, by defining uh, what constitutes, uh, what, that the sex does not include sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, we have to have a Congress that is able to do that and up for the task. Right now, we don't have that kind of a Congress. So uh, notwithstanding your 501c3 status, uh, there, are, there is good and plenty reason to uh, continue to press hard in the electoral process for conservatives, social conservatives, and people of faith uh, to be in office. Mike, there are some cases that go, are going to affect uh, women, especially in sports. Uh, I know ADF's part of that. I don't think, I think you were associated with ADF at one point. I don't, I don't know if you still are and perhaps only they can speak directly to this case, but uh, there are uh, women that are suffering in their sports careers as a result of transgenderism, where you literally have men coming over and now competing against women, taking away those competitive advantages and uh, really harming their careers. Uh, how does this affect those upcoming cases? I think that remains to be seen. Gorsuch said uh, as much in his, uh, in his uh, opinion that we're only dealing with the sex discrimination in employment cases. We're not presented with or dealing with uh, other cases regarding athletics or uh, dress codes or uh, uh, employment or um, educational situations. But quite frankly, uh, it, it creates, I think, an uphill battle uh, uh, for um, uh, women in sports. Title IX was enacted many years ago to uh, provide an avenue for women uh, females to be able to participate uh, in in sports activities, all of those um, all of those gains that women have achieved in Title IX will, if this decision is applied to Title IX, be lost uh, by the inclusion uh, or the ability of uh, transgender people to um, male biological males who uh, uh, purport to be females to be able to compete in uh, in those athletic contests. I know that the ADF has a case in Connecticut involving. Uh, 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 some young women uh, who, who have been who have been objecting to the inclusion of transgender males in uh, women's sports. I think it's a track and field oriented event, and I think those are valid complaints. Uh, it remains to be seen how the Supreme Court will deal with those uh, complaints should they come before it, and it'll take years to get there and millions of dollars uh, in the process to to do that. Uh, but all the while, those four liberal justices are going to be right where they are, and so we have to cobble together five conservatives to uh, support uh, uh, to support the rights of women to participate without being challenged by uh, biological males. It's going to be a tough and uphill battle. The answer is, I don't know how that's going to work out, but I think that those uh, uh, kinds of activities are in jeopardy because of this decision. I want to go back a little bit to the uh, actual makeup of the Supreme Court. Is Roberts, uh, is Roberts a lost cause? At this point, uh, I, I'm thinking that in, I, in respect to today's decision uh, on DACA, uh, he seems to be regularly siding with more liberals on, on the on the court. I, ha I haven't read the DACA decision as yet. Uh, I did see the headline that the court uh, had uh, uh, determined that uh, President Trump did not have the right to uh, end or rescind the DACA program. I'm not quite sure why the court concluded concluded that, and I take it from your comment that Roberts uh, joined with the liberals in, in uh, that determination, but I'll take a look at that. Uh, I don't know why he, I don't know, you know, is he a lost cause? I don't know. I think it's uh, somewhat of a disappointment uh, in many respects. Uh, uh, I was disappointed uh, recently by his uh, concurring opinion in uh, the denial of emergency injunctive relief to a California church to uh, uh, challenge the uh, California governor's uh, unfair and unequal treatment of churches in the COVID uh, virus uh, shutdown uh, situation. Uh, Robert's uh, concurring opinion, uh, he joined the four liberals, uh, uh, stands for the proposition that in a temporary emergency such as the COVID virus, which has killed uh, uh, over 100,000 Americans, there's no known cure, no known vaccine, and that these are temporary orders, 
that in those cases, uh, there is no violation of uh, First Amendment free exercise uh, uh, rights. I disagree with that, uh, but he concluded that as long as churches are treated co-equally with other similarly situated entertainment venues like theaters, there can be no First Amendment violation. Colorado is uh, one of those uh, states where lawsuits uh, were being prepared to be filed against the governor for uh, disparate treatment of churches in this regard. The governor has, since that Roberts uh, concurring opinion in that Supreme Court decision, uh, made his uh, executive orders and public health orders consistent uh, uh, with the treatment of churches and theaters and other venues of large audience. So it makes it a very difficult lawsuit. But I think the key word in that in that opinion is temporary. So long as these orders are temporary and there's no evidence that they're not temporary right now because they've been in place since March 11 and keep, keep getting extended every month by new executive orders, uh, we have serious problems, I think, in religious liberty uh, situations. Well, Mike, we've got to wrap up here in the next few minutes. Uh, here's what I have heard from you today that I kind of want to summarize and, and please correct me as we kind of wrap up here. Uh, this was a bad decision <laughs> uh, when it comes to Bostock. This was a bad decision for those of us that uh, are concerned with the original intent of the Constitution, which is a strategic priority of Colorado Christian University. It was a bad decision for those that are textualists, and I know there's a there's kind of a philosophical difference between those two sometimes. But uh, it was a bad decision for those of us that care about separation of powers and feel like there's a role for the legislature to play uh, in defining our laws and, uh, and the original intent of what those laws were. I think we can all agree that the original intent of uh, the Civil Rights Act was, that, was not this. And so uh, this was a bad decision made by somebody that we expected to make good decisions. And so uh, there's confusion, there's frustration. But at the same time, well, before I get to, over to that, this decision is going to have a lot of consequences. It's going to have a lot of consequences for uh, those that are Christians in the public square. Uh, we're going to end up with probably a lot of lawsuits and, uh, and uh, a lot of battles for uh, many decades as a result of this, uh, as you equated it to the bad decision that was made in Roe v. Wade. Um, so what do we do? Uh, we can uh, buckle back and say, well, even the best uh, and the most conservative judges, they're going to be corrupted by the, by the swamp and the whole process is lost and we should just uh, let our country go. Or as the words of Bill Armstrong after Obergefell or your words today, uh, you fight. Uh, you fight for what's right. You fight for what's true. You fight for what the Bible says is right and, uh, and righteous. Uh, we don't back away from that. It may be hard. It may be dark, but we mount our horses. We ride to the sound of gunfire because the republic for our children and our grandchildren are at stake. And so we work to get more conservative judges in there. Uh, we work at our law schools to reform the understanding of jurisprudence and, and the, the role that lawyers play and the role that judges play and the importance of, of uh, a strong three branches of government. And we reform and we labor and uh, we do our best to hand to our children and grandchildren a country uh, that can maintain uh, the principles of its founding. So that's what I heard today. It's tough. This was a bad decision. It should be claimed as a bad decision, but we're going to fight on uh, and there's work to be done. Did I get your uh, recommendations right there, Mike? Oh, absolutely. I could not have said it better myself. I'm glad you said it that way. And, and I, I want to say the key really is the, the last point. We just cannot lay down. We just cannot give in. We just cannot give up. We must continue this battle. We must fight and fight and fight and never give in. That's right. And there are great institutions like Colorado Christian University and other law schools across this country that are trying to prepare uh, the next generation of leaders. And so uh, as we close here, I want to encourage you, if this is a time where you're still at home, uh, perhaps you were laid off as a result of uh, the decisions made around COVID-19 and you were looking for that next chapter of your life. Colorado Christian University is a great opportunity for you. Over 8,000 students uh, from countries all over the world are getting their degrees with Colorado Christian University. That is uh, over 80 degree programs. 
80% of our students receive some sort of financial aid. And so we want to help you. We want you to uh, go to that next chapter of your life, whether it's online school or NC uh, on campus at Colorado Christian University. We are standing strong. One of our strategic priorities, it's written into one of on our website is the original intent of the Constitution, which is why we disagree with this uh, ruling. Uh, we also think it's a rejection of the biblical teachings of, of male and female. And so there's a lot of reasons why we disagree with it. But if you want to go to a school and uh, you want your children and grandchildren to be educated in this uh, form, check out ccu.edu. We'd love to have you be a part of it. Mike, any closing words as we wrap up here? No, I thank you very much, Jeff. It's an honor to be associated with CCU and Centennial Institute. And I'm just very proud of the great work that you have done and continue to do. Thank you so much. Great. And Mike, thank you. Uh, years of service. Uh, you have made our country better. You've defended the sanctity of life. You've stood strong for uh, our Constitution and its original intent and our founding principles. So uh, uh, we are so grateful to have you as a fellow at Colorado Christian University and at the Centennial Institute. Give my best to Jane. We're so grateful for her, too. And uh, we'll, to all of you that are watching, thank you. We've got a number of upcoming events so be sure to stay tuned to our website. Uh, we're going to continue to cover these decisions as they come through. But thank you again, Mike. Thanks for everyone joining us. We'll see you next time. God bless you.